Va bene, iniziamo. Buonasera a tutti, benvenuti. Io sono Ilaria Menolascina, curatrice di OGR Public Program, il nuovo progetto di formazione eh, promosso e sostenuto dalla Fondazione per l'Arte Moderna e Contemporanea CRT in collaborazione con le OGR. Quello di oggi è il primo di oltre 40 incontri che si susseguiranno da oggi a dicembre. Io vi invito a, ehm, a voler mh, consultare periodicamente la sezione Education del sito delle OGR per essere sempre informati e aggiornati su quelli che saranno i prossimi incontri e quindi eventualmente a prenotarvi. Dicevamo l'incontro di questa sera è il primo, quello inaugurale, e eh, io sono grata e onorata di avere qui due ospiti di eccezione, l'artista Tino Segal e il curatore Luca Cerizza, che sono i protagonisti della mostra che ha inaugurato venerdì nel binario 1 delle OGR e che se non avete ancora visto vi invito veramente eh, di andare a vivere più che, più che vedere perché eh, come dice lo stesso Tino Segal è un'esperienza, un'esperienza che bisogna vivere e vi invito davvero a farlo. Uh, non mi dilungherei oltre, eh, vorrei solo ringraziare ancora gli ospiti per aver accettato l'invito, ringrazio tutti voi per essere qui e buon proseguimento. Time. Um, grazie, buonasera a tutti, um, grazie di essere venuti, numerosi, e di essere venuti immagino anche a vedere o rivedere uh, la mostra di Tino Segale, vi invito appunto a a tornare se potete, se volete, più volte, anche grazie a un biglietto molto democratico, a un prezzo di un biglietto molto democratico, perché veramente è, è, un, è un organismo in continua evoluzione e in cambiamento e quindi necessita di, eh, di molto tempo. Oggi stavo pensando che il lavoro di Tina è in qualche modo una medicina contro il, come si dice, attention deficit, contro la, la, la mancanza di attenzione, la sindrome della mancanza di attenzione, anche se si, appunto, si può entrare, si può uscire, si può avere anche uno sguardo distratto. Vorrei usare questo palcoscenico per alcuni ringraziamenti eh, dovuti, uno è ovviamente a Nicola Ricciardi, il direttore di OGR, che non vedo qua, ma eh, che è stato um, quello che mi ha invitato a pensare a una mostra in questi spazi incredibili, anche se impegnativi. Eh, vorrei ringraziare ehm, Samuele eh, e Valentina che, hanno, eh, che sono i curatori anche eh, del, dell'OGR che, che hanno lavorato per la mostra ma nella mostra perché sono due degli interpreti, dei tanti interpreti che forse avete incontrato in questa stanza. Vorrei ringraziare moltissimo Cora Gianolla, l'assistente di Tino che è stata, si può usare una facile metafora, la locomotiva in questo posto, la locomotiva di questa mostra, lavorando alle audizioni, a lunghissime audizioni ehm, qua ehm, a Torino. Ehm, e vorrei ringraziare l'ufficio stampa dell'OGR, la Raffacco, che ha fatto un lavoro incredibile, come forse si è visto in questi giorni di presenza sulla stampa delle, di questa mostra. E vorrei veramente ringraziare Ilaria per organizzare questo, questo incontro. E, come si dice, last but not least, eh, vorrei ringraziare Tino di, essere, di aver accettato un invito sulla base in verità di, eh, di uno spazio che era ancora in costruzione, anzi di un'istituzione che ancora non c'era, di uno spazio che ancora era eh, non finito quando l'abbiamo visitato la prima volta. Ehm, continuo in italiano ma eh, passerò all'inglese tra poco, Tino mi segue un pochino. Are you following a little bit? <ride> e, niente, eh, con, vorrei partire con una piccola introduzione, eh, diciamo, eh, biografica. Ho conosciuto Tino nel... Ho visto la prima volta il suo lavoro nel 2002 a Manifesta e un, ci siamo conosciuti a Berlino e da lì è iniziato un dialogo che ha portato ad una, ad una mostra eh, alla Galleria Massimo Menini nel 2004, che si chiamava Don't Expect Anything, era una piccola collettiva e Tino Segal eh, era eh, insieme a due altri artisti, due artisti concettuali storici, Robert Berry e Ian Wilson. Per rendere questa mostra possibile, cioè perché ci fossero dei corpi che abitavano una galleria, cosa non scontata, eh, avevo scritto eh, una, una visita guidata che era interpretata dal personale della galleria, dove si raccontavano i lavori in mostra e a un certo punto si interpretava eh, il lavoro di Segal. Um, e veniva spiegato all'interno di questo lavoro di cosa si trattava, um, i, i temi diciamo, e, e le idee che stavano alla base del suo lavoro. 
Eh, io, io stesso ho interpretato questa azione che si chiamava This is About ehm, e raggiungevo il suo apice quando, dopo, dopo che mi ero contorto in, come se fossi in preda ad una convulsione, dicevo con una voce cavernosa, molto simile a quella del protagonista dell'esorcista, che voi vi ricordate, What is it about? Cioè di che cosa stiamo parlando, di cosa si tratta? E poi spiegavo il lavoro dell'artista, almeno dal mio punto di vista. Eh, qualcuno, mi disse, qualcuno del pubblico mi disse che un, un visitatore più o meno urlò eh, scandalizzato dicendo questa è la fine dell'arte durante, durante la mostra. Sono contento di eh, verificare che l'arte non sia finita, almeno, almeno così mi, mi sembra, e che non sia neanche finito il lavoro di Tino Segal. Eh, ma d'altro canto mi sembra che, che l'arte di questi ultimi forse 10-15 anni eh, eh, si sia in parte rinnovata o modificata o abbia introdotto degli elementi ad esempio molto vicini alla danza, alla danza contemporanea, alla coreografia, alla performance, abbiano un aspetto appunto più eh, performativo, anche se poi parleremo della differenza di, rispetto al lavoro di Segal in questo senso. Io credo che, che il lavoro di, di Segal dai primi anni del 2000 abbia avuto un grande impatto e importanza in questa nuova attenzione verso questo tipo di pratiche. Quindi, to switch to English, I would like to ask... I could understand, though, like... Maybe you can do your well, question. The, the question is in English in any case. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I would like to ask him 14 years after, what is it about? Di cosa stiamo parlando? In a nutshell, in a, probably a few words, but just to, intro, to introduce the old philosophy of, of your practice. Um, <clears throat> yeah, anyway, as, first of all, thank you for for following my work for so long, 2003 seems a long time ago. And um, thank you all for coming here on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm sorry that I can't see you well, I'm trying to see you. Um, what, is it, what is it about? I mean, there's many answers to this question, so... Is it working, the translation? I've never <laughs> seen this. Wait. There's someone behind us. Who doesn't understand English? Or who understands English? Better way to ask. Okay. Half. Less than half. No, it was like half. Giuseppe, are you happy? Where's Giuseppe? Are you happy with my microphone? It's good? <laughs> okay, good. This is electricity. But <laughs> No, Giuseppe was afraid that I wouldn't hold the microphone against my mouth, but I think it's fine. Stiamo facendo melina per non dire niente per uno... No, scherzo. Now I didn't understand what you said in Italian. Melina is a technical term of football when you pass the ball constantly not to... Yeah, yeah. Just to spend time, since we play football together as well. So. Yeah, when we were younger. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so what is it about? I mean, there's many answers to this question. I already said that. Are they going to write it again? No. Um, <clears throat> one answer is um, that, in, that I think it's always, a, I always feel sorry or feel sad when people are worried and feel excluded from art because they're asking, what is it about? I don't know what is this about, you know? And there was a, there was, there was a Polish um, doctor called Ludwig Fleck in the 1930s and he is the he was the the first to do like science studies or history of science yeah so like the the science of science what is science science is not a, like a natural thing it's a specific thing in the western countries with which follow certain rules which follow certain belief systems uh, they didn't get the name Yeah, okay. And um, so and so Fleck kind of I don't know, maybe you all know the word paradigm. The word paradigm that was something which was kind of invented by this other historian of science who was then much more famous in the in the sixties, Thomas Kuhn. Um but basically all to make it a little bit shorter, everything that you maybe know about Thomas Kuhn or about the word paradigm, that's the thinking 
of comes from Fleck, and Fleck. So Fleck said, you know, that you know science works like this. There's like people. There's an inner circle of people, scientists working together um, in a laboratory. Then they publish this in a paper. Then this paper maybe gets into a handbook for students. Then the students. Um, maybe write something in a magazine later. So it's like these kind of concentric circles. Like there's the, the innermost circle of the scientists. And then he says, but when art, so all science fu functions like that, but art has two concentric circles at the middle. So it's the only s activity which works similar to science but has two core circles. And one is the art and the other one is the reception, the critic or you. Yeah. So it, there is no meaning. It's not that there's one truth like in science. It's like the meaning gets generated in this interplay or in this interplay. So you can never ask really what it's about because you are the answer. Whatever you're feeling or thinking, what's making you think is the answer. And if you, if you see something that doesn't make you think anything, it's probably just not good, you know? So that's one, one answer. Then another answer is like in my case, what am I interested in? Maybe. What am I interested in? I think in my work, but that doesn't mean that you have to or you have to believe in that or think that's the truth or something. I was interested when I started, and I'm still interested in that. That like, let's say, in the industrial societies of the Occident, of the Western Hemisphere, that we made this kind of experiment in the last 300 years. You can say that industrial society is a kind of experiment um, where we kind of do a lot of things that most other societies on this planet never did. You know, For example, I mean, one small example, or big example, is that most societies didn't embrace change. They didn't want things to change because change is a risk, you know? And... Um, Change, things can change for the worse. And like Western societies made a big effort to say, no, no, we want change and we believe change can be good. That's what we call progress. You know? And so similar to this idea of change, there were many other things that the West tried after the Renaissance, which were very unusual in the history of mankind. And one other idea was to think the good life comes from producing many things. And so the 19th century sees this kind of rapid increase of like the production of goods. And the idea was, and this was a very, very new and unusual idea, um, that the good life comes from producing things and that... Um, <laughs> that nice jacket. I like your jacket and your jumper. <laughs> um, so... The good life comes from producing many things and consuming them. While most traditional societies, indigenous societies, also the aristocracies of Western societies always had the idea that the good life comes from transforming yourself, working on yourself. Yeah, you, you try to transform yourself. You don't try to transform the earth. Because producing things, another way of saying producing many things is, produced, is, is transforming the earth, taking something out of the earth, like natural resources, and making them into things. Yeah? So the old idea was always we work on ourselves. We work on our relation to God, our relation to each other, our relation to ourselves, yeah? my relation to myself. That was the idea of the good life. And the better you do that, the better is your life. And so... You can say that I, when I grew up, I found it very strange that like our temples, like the big, beautiful buildings of our ritual places of our societies, which are the set, cent, center of our settlements, of our cities, that they are places where you contemplate objects. I was like, this is a strange idea. You walk around, you look at objects. No other society ever did that. It's, and museums are, people tend to forget that museums are a relatively new thing. I mean, they exist since like 200, 300 years. It's not like theater, which exists since antiquity, you know, or 
the church mass which exists since like or dance or yeah I mean dance <laughs> as celebration yeah like yeah. exists since a long time but dance on stage music, exists even yeah. less long than yeah. visual art yeah but so for me it was like very I felt it a very related to how our society works so we believe the good life is producing many things then in our temple we also look at things I was like oh that's why we celebrate things because we believe the good life comes from producing things and I was not so sure about that as a teenager I was very bored because I grew up in a city where there was production of Daimler Benz, Hüvle Packard and IBM so every, everybody was involved in industrial production I was like it's kind of boring like I don't believe that the, uh, the good life will come from things I'm much more interested in my relation to myself my relation to other people maybe my relation to to higher spheres you know so my work was the idea basic idea of my work is to let's go into this temple of things and remind or try to see if we can celebrate again also these relations between people in our temples and then you know over the years I understood that may, that also meant celebrating our relation to each other in a less collective way because if you think of a church or a concert it's very collective you know mm. like um <clears throat> It's very, it's very collective. We come together like here. There's also same, verticality. Yeah. So it's one direction. One direction. And then I realized, oh, doing it in a museum makes everything much more individualized, much more liberal. People are afraid of this word nowadays, but it's a word that we all engage in. You can also say more free, you know? And so, yeah, that, that was my intention. I don't know if that's what my work is about, but those were my, that's let's say my main starting point, yeah. Did I get this? Sorry, Giuseppe, now I didn't talk into the microphone. Um, well, uh, yeah. Um, there was a... In this, in this thing, um, this uh, um, few pages that we printed with different texts from different authors, a long interview by Ansari Obers, very recent, Tino, and an old text from Jörg Geiser, we uh, printed, we translated for the first time in Italian, a statement, a few uh, lines that you wrote back in 2002, where you explain somehow this, this position very clearly, and you start with the idea, starting from the idea of political art. What is political art? Now, in the same years, I remember there was a show curated by Dorothea von Altemann in, in Cologne, very interesting show, I remember, and its title, a bit ironic, your work was there uh, in Ludwig Museum, it was Ludwig, no? And the title of the show was I Promise It's Political, which was a sort of pun to say, okay, look at this show, there's no really documentation about uh, an assassination or a political case, but there's something very political in seeing your performance or seeing a, a wall of Yeppe Hein moving slowly. Um, so since uh, this was one point in your statement, um, how do you promise <laughs> this is political, I mean that your work, how do you see the political aspect of your, you already kind of answered, but I would like to, 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 to continue from, from the premises that you anticipated now. Yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, it's easy to promise something is political <laughs> in a political space like a museum, you know, like because everything is political if it gets valued or valorized by an institution which is highly legitimate in our societies, you know, so so that's why, I'd like, I promise it's political, it was, it's a tautology, mm. you know, like anything, this is something I was thought which comes from Daniel Buren, French artist, some of you may know, like, Buren says, yeah, if you put something in the public, it's political, because anything you do comes with a certain set of values, how I'm sitting here, how he is dressed, how I'm dressed, it comes with a certain set of values around many, many things, you know, what does it mean today that you can wear jogging trousers in public? You know, what, what they, even if I cannot express these values, there are values in that, you know, um, which a good kind of cultural studies person could, or, you know, analyst could analyze, you know. So there's always values. If you put those values into a public place, it's political, you know, like any, 
I mean, I would say, I, I would even go further, say like any action that you do in a society which is as transparent as ours, where like you can, any choice you make in a supermarket will immediately, is like data which is fed back to the, um, <clears throat> back to the producing company. Um, they will take this information, review it, and then think, okay, this is working well, this isn't working well, this is what people want, you know? Anything that you do in such a transparent society as ours, where every movement now with social media even more is like is monitored to then produce new production, which means produce new reality also, you know, because the production of things is is, is a large part of our reality. So it's it's you it's difficult. You cannot not be political. Even if I say I want to extract myself from this society, it's very political. If I say I want to go live like as a kind of hermit somewhere in the mountains, my friends will still know. It will be a political thing. They're like, oh wait, he wants to opt out out of our society. So it's a, it's an easy thing. Then I think it's a different approach to politics. Exactly, I would like, yeah, to it's go a, more into It's a area. different approach to politics. Also, like, not to represent politics, but to do politics. So, <clears throat> for example, I was very happy personally, you know, today because it's like, when the exhibition is more full, I don't know if some of you were in, it's like a temporary community. It's like a community, but it's a little bit more liberal. You can, you can feel this community feeling, but you can come and go when you want, you know? So it's not the same kind of community as here right now, where you're like, okay, it's 5.30, you have to be here, and if you leave, Luca and Tino and everybody else mm -hmm. will see that you are leaving, you know? Like, oh, you can leave, you can come, you can stay two hours, you can stay two seconds, you know, that's that's a kind of a more flexible, more liberal community. And in that sense, it mirrors, or it, it proposes something for an individualized society. Because we are definitely an individualized society, we all are following our own life path. It's not our mother, it's not the church, it's not our father, it's not the conventions anymore telling us what to do. It's very much our own choice. Even if that's an ideology, the ideology of choice, we cannot escape. Don't know if they were able to translate that. <laughs> you cannot escape the ideology of choice. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so for me, it's interesting to say how can we bring back elements of the collective without being so rigid as they used to be. You know, I mean, maybe in Italy, these older elements are more present of rigid collectivity. You have to go, if you live in a small village, you have to go to the church on Sunday morning because otherwise people are saying, what, what, what's up with them or something. Um, I mean, this exists maybe more here than in northern Europe, but this old school collective rigidity, most places has made way for a kind of individualism, very heightened individualism where people are just following their own life path. You can, you can break away from your family, you can break away from your partner. Maybe the last thing that you rarely can break away from are your children. You can decide which gender you are, you can choose which nationality you kind of want to affiliate with almost if you spend 10 years in one country. I mean, everything has become a choice. And there's very little of this kind of communal aspect. And I think that we miss this communal aspect. I mean, in, in England, now they have created a ministry for loneliness. Mm, yeah, some days ago. Yeah. And now Germany is thinking about it too. I don't think Italy doesn't need one, I think. <laughs> no, because you have these older values, you know? So, anyway, I think... Sorry, maybe I'm speaking too long, you have to interrupt me, but it, this is a political space. It has certain values. For example, it's one of the values of the museum is individualism. We celebrate individuals, artists. We go there individually. We decide individually how long we stay, with who we go, if we talk or not. It's very individualistic. And to bring something more community -orient, communal, collective into that space, it proposes that this is a, a more important thing, question today, again. Yeah, you make me think that I should skip to question number seven because it's, <laughs> because it's perfect about... I, I can continue about what, what you say about the community. Now there is this... Uh, you, you might have read it. This uh, text, this essay of Boris Groys, the art critic, uh, called Polic Politics of Installation of a few years ago. And he claims that installation art has the capacity to shape contem contemporary communities uh, into the museum. Um, 
he makes a distinction between the, the, the collection, which, uh, which uh, works for the individual per perception, um, and, the, uh, and the installation, which somehow encourages a community uh, to, to be created. And he said that uh, this community, well, the community, uh, in the community, the artist somehow is the, is the, is the legislator. Is the, he rules that. Uh, um, so um, then I found this phrase of Philippe Pareno uh, uh, in, a recent, uh, in a recent book, I think about the show you also uh, were part of, you collaborated, said, and he was saying, uh, the question was how to give back to the, to the public, to the audience, uh, its characteristic of population. Um, so I was wondering, I mean, when we see, especially today, for example, where it's quite crowded, the exhibition space, there is, I found this beautiful feeling of a, of a plaza, of a piazza, of a square, you know, where if you, even if you walk, you have a, some chatting because people are talking to each other and there's some movement, there's this beautiful continuous flow and this gathering. So um, I would like to, to, to you to continue to articulate about this, uh, is how the museum for you perform this uh, social function. And especially here with this exhibition. The space here is somehow a bit rigid, it's very long, there's no other rooms, uh, but nevertheless, probably because of that, created this sort of uh, 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 yeah, feeling of a square. That was my feeling when you come in. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with Boris Groys. I mean, I didn't read this text, so I don't know which artist is he thinking of, because I he think... He never mentioned any artist. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I think that installation normally doesn't produce temporary communities because you walk through, so yeah. what does it actually miss? Because mostly your installation, you just walk through it, you know? It's like, I often think that installations are like set design without anything happening, you know? And if you think of the beginnings of minimal art, for example, Robert Morris, one of the main minimal artists, he started his work, it was actually set design for his um, friends from dance, yeah. like Simon Forti and, and Yvonne Rayner. Yeah. So, and I think in the 90s, the relational aesthetics, it was often like literally a kind of set design where something could happen, then they would resort to fiction. They would say like a scenario, a fiction, like, and like mm. something could happen here, but nothing ever happened, you know? And so I think what was missing is and then I think there are very few artists, it's like if you have an environment, let's say, a kind of set design, installation, and then in that environment something happens, you, but which develops in time, then you can have a temporary community, if it's interesting enough, which goes and stays there. But I think there's very few, so for example, somebody I don't necessarily, it's not, I'm not the biggest fan of is Thomas Hirschhorn, when he does his kind of monuments, mm. Like, I think that produces a temporary community. Yeah. And then Philippe Pareno, who had the show here also in Milano, Hanga Bicocca, because it's, there's... Time the, involved. Time also. involved, music involved, like development involved. Then people start to stay, or in my work, or maybe also Henri Salas or Pierre Wiergis work sometimes. But it's actually not so easy to generate. Yeah. I think it happens very rarely. But it's a kind of new thing, like some people call it now time-based exhibitions or something, you know, which is a new phenomenon of this, I mean, I do it with people, other people do it with these kind of um, programs which actually come from Disneyland, with these computer programs which then say, okay, now this thing goes on, now that thing yeah. goes on. Sorry, Giuseppe. It's more like the Pareno, as a, the, the exhibition as a machine somehow, yeah. no? that is, there's no real people involved there, but mm. is there a problem with lights? No, I just, he said I should really talk into the microphone, so this was one moment I didn't speak into the microphone. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting that you were saying about Robert Morris, because an interest, there is a sim, in respect to minimalism, there is what minimalism also did uh, uh, that was very strong is this idea of, of a work that shared the same space of the audience, no, on the floor, so you, even you walk on it like Arlander. So in this case here, many years after, you really share the same space, even with the fact that your interpreters are basically dressed like us. There's no, there's no costume, there's no... And there's this porosity, no? this ambiguity sometimes of like, who is, uh, who is the audience, who is the... apart from some moments. But, um, so this sharing, I think, is very beautiful, and, it's, uh, and in fact, there's no one privileged position. 
you don't have to, there's no one specific place you, you see the exhibition better, but you have to constantly move as the choreography constantly moves. Yeah. The no, sharing of, of, of the same. No, I definitely, that's one of the things I think is a very good observation. Like, it's definitely what I took from minimal art also, not consciously, but it's mm. interesting to hear speak about that. Like, yeah, from Carl Andre, like, like you're literally, Morris itself yeah, you're the literally mirrors. in the space and there's like co-presence of the, of this kind of human scaled object and the, and the human. And so mm. I actually made it a human maybe, not consciously, but, um, I wanted to say something else about what you just said. What was the last thing that you said at the very end? I wanted to reply the to... The sharing of... The, no, the sharing of the space you answered. The different uh, points of view. No? Ah, yeah. <laughs> the different points of view, exactly. For example, like because you were asking about the inherent politics of these gatherings. You know, each time you bring people together, a group of people, you're always... It's very difficult not to represent society. The moment you bring people together, you represent an idea of society, of a structure of society. So, for example, if you think of like a theater, like if you think of the theaters of the 19th century, because I think privileged position, so like you would have the better seats for the higher classes, you know, then also you would have like maybe people who were kind of in these loges as families, then you would have the kind of you know, lower classes, they were standing, and you can see the stage, but you can also see society. So it's, it's a representation of the abstract, it's a concrete representation or a concrete enactment of the abstract structures of society because it's not so clear, like, you know, when I, when I walk across the street, it's not clear, like, where's my role? So it has to, I mean, I know it, but it has to sometimes be kind of hammered in, you know? And so this thing of like having different viewpoints, being able to work around in the museum is a very democratic thing. And that, this was one of the reasons, I, I mean, I'm somebody who's very interested in museum studies. One of the reasons actually why museums were built, museums weren't necessarily, according to museum studies, museums weren't necessarily built because people loved art so much and wanted to find a nice building to show art. Now, there were very concrete political reasons. Like, for example, one reason was that, like, they wanted a place where the lower classes could observe the higher classes, how to be a little bit more, change their bodily <laughs> attitude. So, for example, I mean, there's very funny stories about this. For example, the National Gallery in London was built between the East End and the West End because... Um, they had a problem in England that on Mondays there was not a lot of production because the men were still drunk. Because mm -hmm. the men would always go into the pub in the weekend. Now this is not a, it sounds like a joke, no, no, but no. it's true, you know? Like, so the men would always go in the pub and then Monday they would still be drunk. So the people, the social reformers were thinking, what can we do that, what can they, what can happen on the weekend apart from the pub and where they can go with their wives? <laughs> so, so in the gallery, go to the gallery and then you know, the, the nation can be more productive. You know, what that if you are drunk in the museum? <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, you're not allowed. <laughs> like, you're not allowed in. You have a certain comportment. You know, there's, a, for example, a caricature, which I like to um, mention uh, from this time of the beginning of the museums, and you see kind of people, like a mob of people. How do you say mob in Italian? Like a, a gang, like a, a gang, no, a group. Fool, yeah, in French, and fool, like a, a kind of a mob of people, like a kind of. Un group, un check, yeah. Yeah, like, but like, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Come traducete la parola mob in Italian? Una massa, si, un gruppo, una. Can you answer? The kind of translator answer? No. Folla. Massa. <laughs> okay, in folla, I think. <laughs> I'm going to take folla. So, um,. <clears throat> So you see this kind of folla, this mob of people, they're drunk, the men are like kind of touching the women, everybody's like kind of all over the place, and all are kind of like together, you know? And, and they are in front of a kind of grand building. And then the second image of the caricature, you see them inside this grand building, and this grand building is a museum, and you see the same people nicely split up into individuals, into couples, 
And so before then, this like Dionysiac, like, Wah! and then inside then this Apollinian, like, hmm, <laughs> like nicely ordered. And that's a lot what, that's the inherent politicity or the inherent politics of these spaces. They have a certain governmental um, function. Yeah? And people, th it's, people think it's about art and the beauty of art. Yes, but that's just... Um, that's, That's right. That comes second or third. Like the, one of the main guys from museum studies, Tony Bennett, he goes so far, and, and, and art historians, you know, will hate this, but um, Tony Bennett says the, the objects, I mean the artworks, are props for the kind of behavior or the performance of the visitors. Mm. It's tough for art historians because... You're not yet there yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the objects are props. How do you say props? Like you know, like what you have on stage, a little like. Sì, sì. Come si dice? Pupazzi o. Yeah, they're little, little, little like kind of um, tools, little assistant objects for what is actually happening, which is a physical refocusing of people's behavior. You know? um, yeah. Um, yeah, that we could go on already for hours about this. But um, I would like to come back to um, one aspect that I always found very interesting and important in your, or it is for me important in your work, and which is the the relation with the technological landscape your work was born in somehow. No, you started to, uh, first works from 2000, right? Right. So, which actually was on stage, one of the first works still, like uh, Goodbye 20th Century, where you were dancing extracts from history of dance of, of the 20th century. Uh, but let's say, uh, um, what always I found fascinated is the relation on many as aspects of, of the technology. And you wrote also a little bit in this, you, you told a bit in the conversation with Aubrey, saying your work as an algorithm, and we can uh, discuss this later. But probably the, the, the most, uh, the evident or simple aspect of it is the relation with the fruition of the work. Um, so with the social media, I mean, your work started a bit before, right? Uh, so at the beginning, you were even uh, was easier then to uh, stop people by doing picture in your exhibitions. Um, um, but nevertheless, in those years, the, with the social media, with the digital realm, the, the possibility of documenting the shows, we somehow uh, get information about art, we see show exhibitions through social media, through internet, through YouTube, more and more. Um, somehow, the, 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 your work, to me, uh, was a very early attempt to try to reverse this thing, or to say, okay, no, you really have to, to come, you have really to experience live that thing, which is art, which is whatever it is. But um, so this is one aspect that I found uh, uh, very interesting. Now, of course, uh, uh, also your work changed. It became also more complex, uh, as you, we can see. In a, but still, this, this, this question, I think. Uh, and now, coming back to the, the first uh, question, uh, we see a lot of dance exhibition has been defined or, or, or exhibition that has to do with body, with performativity, with time-based practices, exactly because institutions as well somehow need people to come, uh, to come and see or to come and, and experience. So I would like to, to articulate a little bit about well, the question of fruition in, 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 uh, in our times and in, uh, in your work. Well, what do you mean exactly by fruition? Fruition, uh, uh, I don't know if it's correct, fruition in Italian, like the experience, the, the way you deal, you experience the, uh, the work. Well, first of all, I think that like, it's true that when I, my work started, there was not all this kind of, you know, smartphones, didn't even, uh, even mobile phones didn't really exist. Um, but I think also in society, I think we have like the, it's paradoxical. We have the two, like these kind of smartphones, social media, they bring two different processes, which are kind of, I think, I mean, this is just me, you know, reflecting, and maybe you have a different opinion, and I'm, I don't know so much about this stuff. But I think that, like, on the one hand, obviously, people 
maybe less in Italy than in other countries, because Italy has this culture of like talking, you know, like on the piazza and being kind of open, a bit like the Americans also. I mean, a very different way than the Americans, obviously, but there's an openness here to talk. And there's a culture of that to talk with strangers. But in general, I say all over the world, it's more like people are are less likely to engage with people around them and um, more likely to kind of engage with, you know, asking their phone, like, where should I go or something. And so, yeah, there's definitely this aspect of, like, less social interaction. But on the other hand, because people also realize that they're a lot in their phone, they have a real embodied experience of what it means to... I know a lot of people also switch off their phones or put it away for the holidays and they start to develop a culture also this idea of like FaceTime you know like I have real face to face time mm -hmm. with you <laughs> that people are like they really like there's there's texting there's phoning there's video phone there's real life interaction mm -hmm. you know like and this becomes a more like the, the strongest form of interaction if texting is the lowest form of interaction than, than, than this kind of actual so there's also becomes a kind of cherishing or a valorization of this actual being together. You know? So I think, which goes into the different, and I think that's also one of the um, reasons why my work experiences certain success, that people enjoy this kind of like actual, mm. like face-to-face like -face energetic, um, energetic interaction. Yeah. Um, well, we could say that um, I would like to play a bit of the devil's advocate on this point mm. of the experience. This is basically the same question I, I posed to Xavier Leroy, who is mm. an old friend of yours, and I think probably quite important for your mm. development. If you are, uh, is a very important uh, contemporary choreographer for France, but living in Berlin. And I interviewed him for Domus in the number of January. We did a, a few pages about you. And I asked uh, Xavier, if Tino succeeds in discussing the commodification of the art object, what about the risk that even experience could become a commodity? Do you think his work represents a, a form of experience economy? And this is to say that, yes, you, you f let's say, force, and you encourage, and it's great for people to come and come again. On the other side, of course, institutions, OGR, but the Tate, or uh, somehow are more and more now based on, on trying to attract audience to come to experience here and there only something, um, even if it's mediated or not by Instagram or... or. So uh, how do you... Well, that, well the, the, the answer of Xavier can be read on, uh, on Domus, but now I would like to hear you. <laughs> I mean, there's many answers to this question. So, first of all, the most philosophic one is that it's, there is no outside of experience. You know, like everything's experience. If I stand in front of a monochrome painting, it's an experience. You know, if I'm you know, like cleaning the diapers of my baby, it's an experience. You know, this, and as long as you're on this planet, you cannot be outside of experience somehow. Maybe when you're sleeping, you're not having experience. I don't know. So. On the one hand, it's tautological a little bit. On the other hand, I know what you mean, and like, definitely, we are in the experience economy. You know, I I would say that like my work is a commodification of experience, and um, there's different ways of organizing societies. And this is maybe a more complex point. Maybe we don't have enough time to really go into this. But like, when you have very big societies, so societies with like millions of people, or maybe now we're in a global society of billions of people. I mean, if you look at these graphs of like how what was the population in the 18th 19th century and then it goes like i mean it goes like this i mean there's never been so many people on the planet as yeah. now and how do you organize these people then the market commodification is a way to organize it we can never be a big family you know seven billion people can be a family maybe 20 people can be a family so how do you keep these people connected how do you kind of organize um you know, social warmth, um, food, shelter. And the, the answer that these big mass democracies found, or mass industrial societies found, was, um, <clears throat> was the market. And now we, we do everything via the market. Now, is that a good thing? I'm not sure, but do we have a better idea? 
because the market is a way of connecting many people in an anonymous way. So it's a good thing. It works well for large societies. And then we have the tendency to put everything through this channel because that's the one channel that works. You know, Italy is a bit different because you kept the family channel, the older traditional bond, like blood bond. Mm. You kept that's another way of organizing society. Like the mafia also works with that. It works with the blood bond, not with the market bond. Um, like this is very strong here, mm, but like I said earlier, it doesn't really work on a big, big scale. You know, maybe also because Italy is a smaller country, you kept this kind of blood connection, family connection. Then, yeah, some things make less sense through um, to to be commodified. Like, for example, I would say that also social status is very much commodified through labor. Mm. You know, like you would have, I mean, in traditional societies like feudalism, for example, here in Europe, you would have social status by birth. Like you're born an aristocrat, you are an aristocrat. If you're born a kind of a carpenter, you are a carpenter and you have that sort of caste or class. And social status is, is organized a priori or via God or via uh, some oppression, you know? And nowadays, it's social status is organized through labor. Basically, you know, you, mm -hmm. it's through your job that your social status gets... Now, is that the best way to do it? I'm not sure. You know, maybe there's other ways of... Or also of partaking in society. If you don't have a job nowadays, you're not really a member of society. That's very... Um, That's quite tough. I mean, there's a lot of things which are much easier in our life nowadays than, you know, in traditional societies, for example, you know, the death rate of ch children at birth is very low. Makes life easier probably by a lot. But um, there's stuff which is tough, which is that we have to constantly fight for our place in society and we can literally fall out of society. I mean, I think in, in this region also there's a lot of unemployment like, and people... I assume people don't feel that they're really full members of society, but um, <clears throat> so I think we, in the course of the next hundred years, I'm sh I'm quite sure that we will see other models of making people belong to society than just work or labor, you know, and just commodification. But this is a channel we have, and you know, commodification is a channel we have, and art also is very much related to commodification from its beginnings. I mean shopping malls or arcades were developed exactly at the same time as exhibitions. Mm -hmm. I mean, the World Fair yeah. um, is a kind of trade show. It's a display of objects. If you walk through an exhibition, you see Boris Groys, who you mentioned earlier, he says like, um, museums are the preschool for consumption. You learn mm -hmm. how to kind of look at an object, have see value in to an display object. And yeah, and then you kind of can do it, you, you get trained and like that objects are important, that they're desirable, then you go to the, to the, the supermarket. To <laughs> I mean, this is Boris Groy saying this, you have to ask him how he exactly thinks that, but there's also historical studies, like there's a really great book called Consumption Culture, which makes shows the whole history of arcades and museums and how even the architecture of these places is structurally the same and how they develop together. So art is always busy with commodification. I mean, like the whole idea of art is you know, to take, is based on things being transportable. So, like, if you think what was art before, it was basically an altar painting. It was fixed in the church. And the art market starts when you take out, start taking out these things of the church and start trading them yeah. and putting them around and putting them in houses or putting them in museums, you know, and, and then producing new ones which are similar and that they can move around. So it's, it's very much... I, based on this idea of commodification. So for me, I'm not saying this is the best channel, but it's the channel of our times, you know? And it's a channel for many people. It's, we don't have another channel which works for billions of people. Speaking of different times, uh, well, you mentioned in many, many, uh, in many occasions, but another aspect that always fascinated me about your work um, is the... Well, I would say, I don't know if it's the correct word, this kind of pre-modern quality in many respects. This relation with orality, with the question of the authorship, uh, with um, uh, this idea of a, of a form that is in constant 
flux or shape that is not written down, that is, doesn't really have, a, have a, let's say, a, a, a physical, uh, that is not cast in, in marble or, or in other material. The sort of idea of an open transmission I found always very fascinating. I think the first time we met, I said something like, oh, you work as something of a traditional song or folk music of a storyteller, something like this, I don't remember. And that is something that I also written about with about different artists. And, and to me, in many respects, our uh, digital age goes back to the pre-modern times in many respects. Think about the way we, uh, yeah, exactly, we, we use the, the digital realms and uh, the shapes is constantly moving and, and, and or we say things you know, from the mouth to the ear, and you know, the gossip that the, the, it goes through the social media, and, and it gets someone else, something else, now completely different. So your your work is somehow, I think, there, and I found it very uh, well. Even if you say that the contract, the, your contract is oral, it somehow is probably where, how it was happening back in the days with shaking hands, and this is my cow, give me. A piece of land or, or, or something like this. So um, um, I found yeah, this very uh, interesting, and of course it connects with this relation with technology, as paradoxically it, it might, might seem. No? So I would like, I don't know, if you want to, to elaborate a little bit on this. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, like, I think we should open it up soon because it comes oh, back sure. to, the, to the... Can we, Laria? Yeah? Possiamo... Yeah, no, we should make I, some... I, we never... Uh, yeah. We can ask, have some questions, no, in a minute from the, we should, yeah, yeah. We still have, we still have an hour. <laughs> we still have an hour, actually. Are we? Oh, okay. Or 50 minutes, 50 minutes, but, yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, it goes a little bit back to the beginning um, of what I said that, yes, yeah, I was bored with, like, growing up in a highly technologized industrial um, environment. I knew what that was, I mean... And so I was a bit bored by that, what, what it could do. I wasn't so convinced that that was the way, the most interesting way to co co kind of go about life. And, and um, yeah, I mean, also what you say about social media, I mean, I think like, yes, like you could say like, Twitter or Instagram, they are like village gossip for a global society, yeah. you know? And, and in a way, we've brought this kind of connective form of everybody talking to each other back, or many people talking to each other, um, back into, into, onto a much bigger kind of scale in terms of quantity. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't so much interested if it's now old or new. For me, it was more a question of like, is it boring or is it kind of um, engaging? You know, and I think nowadays, I think more in terms of like frequencies, like literally frequencies or vibrations, you know, like what has a vibration, a frequency which is higher rather than lower? Um, <clears throat> And you know the higher ones are mostly the the more attractive, also spiritually the more attractive ones or the um, more advanced ones. And how can we, you know, objects are quite low in frequency. That's why they're objects because they have a very low wavelength, you know. And so I was more interested in these things of these higher frequencies of like when you talk to somebody, when you sing, when you look at somebody. Like there's another kind of Frequency of course, there is a long history of art, let's say, especially from, well, all the 20th century, but especially probably after the war, that started to break the object, not to, mm. to open up the object, to create a different experience, to have. But um, yeah, what I, I found extremely interesting is also this idea of this shape. Maybe we can go a little bit uh, um, about the show, no? this shape that is never really, okay, it's not written down, it's not. Uh, uh, there's no project, but uh, it's only transmitted also from from you to your assistant or to other dancers or interpreters. But also the shape itself, the form is in a constant flux, uh, and is in a, and, uh, and you adapt and you add something. Uh, uh, years ago, you were labeling the work. No, there was a, this is situation 2000 and I don't know <laughs> seven or whatever, and Tino Segal. Now, if you saw in the show, there's no 
more labeling. Everything is, uh, as you told me when we met the first time here, said I'm less interested in, uh, in, in the dates of the, art, of the artworks, in the titles, and now, you know, maybe we go to another question, does uh, your somehow big show, large scale, this is probably one large scale show like Palais of Kio or Martin Garpus Bau in the last few years, is one work, I don't know, choreography or one big situation, but big action, there's this constant uh, 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 flux where other works are in, but it's not so important if this is that, and you uh, design uh, a few movements here. This is again goes back to to me, what was a traditional folk song, like for, for, for sake of simplification, traditional song back in the days that was sang by A, and then this guy was going to another village and he was singing and was adding some elements and then he was going somewhere else. And, and, and that thing that was never written down, yet someone like, like the child ballads that, that were written, someone ethnomusicologist went and write down. But for years, for centuries, it went on and on and on and on. And before, uh, so, um, yeah, this is, and, and go, to the, go back to the show. Um, I think this connects with the idea that more and more uh, the medium of, of, that you use is the exhibition. Uh, meaning, uh, yes, there is a, sometimes the exhibition is the museum or you use the entire space. Okay, this, this is not the case, but Palitokyo was the case, I guess, or... Um, so, of course, there's a di strong dialogue with the exhibition space, not in a traditional way of the sex specificity, uh, but still with a, a very uh, a, a careful uh, a hearing of the situation, which is not only physical, but is about who is, who is coming here, at what time, who are, which, which kind of audience here, how, uh, how much they, time they spend. Now, you're very careful, I remember, also, to, to, to see all the conditions and somehow to also react, and not necessarily to impose. And this goes back again a little bit on the algorithm idea, no? of the fact that you're quite flexible in seeing the answer and then giving another uh, answer or, another que or pose another question. So the question was actually, but there are many in one, uh, how do you see the medium of the, uh, of the uh, exhibition as a medium that interests you, apart from the languages of, of dance or music that you use so much uh, uh, music, I think, more and more in your, in your practice. Because, of course, those mediums, sometimes they are presented in different ways, no? Music on stage, like here, or dance in a different context. But I think these mediums are used within the bigger medium, which is the exhibition for, format. Yeah, I, I would go so far to say, like, um, exhibitions is the only thing that really exists. It, art doesn't really... I mean, even the notion of art exists through museums because before there was painting and sculpture in a, let's say, religious context of a church or the decoration a of a house. Then it was painting, it was sculpture, it was part of architecture, it was decoration. It produced meaning, could be very important, like, you know, the, the, the painting at the ceiling of the Uffizi, you know, like the original of first building, the, which I think was the kind of parliament of the city or something, you know, it's an important painting, or is it, oh, no, it's on the side, mm. you know, it's an important painting because it represents, but nonetheless, it's part of, ah, okay. it's part of the city's kind of governmental function, you yeah, know, exactly. it's not a thing in itself, it has a function, and the whole idea of art comes then, is a kind of function as non-function, which is a complicated thing, but basically it's Hegel, you know, because Hegel said, you know, we want to kind of take a distance from things, we want to historicize them, rationalize them, aesthetics, questions of taste, all ways of kind of training distance, which goes back to this caricature, which I was saying before, you know, you take a distance thing, you're not like drunk in a pub, kind of like in a mess of imminence, you are like kind of, you have a distance to, you train distance, you mean you can also have a distance to yourself and your own desires and your own instincts, you know? And that was a very important thing in the West at a certain time, and museums were part of that. And so I think that, that exhibitions are kind of our rituals mm -hmm. of today. They 
exhibitions start at the same time as modern democracy starts. So like literally, like the Louvre gets transformed from the palace of the prince to a museum, you know, two years after the French Revolution. And um, <clears throat> so, I mean, this is a longer conversation, but to try and make it a little bit short, you could say any society has to create a ritual which mirrors the structure of this society. Okay, it's, it's a bit complicated, but like any society creates a ritual that mirrors the structure of, its, of itself, so to kind of remind people, retrain these fundamental categories. So that goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, it's a liberal space, it's an individualized space, it's a place which celebrates objects, it's a place that celebrates the market, all basic constituents of our society. So if you go into these spaces, you know, you can, by changing the ritual, that's why I think it's, or by working on the ritual, it's actually a, polit it's a work on the political DNA. You know, yeah. and so if you look at my work, you can say liberal, yes; individual, yes; <laughs> object, no; market, yes. You know, that's basically you know, like <clears throat> that's the. We should have that do that instead of all these questions. Just the formula <laughs> with tick, tick, tick. Yeah, and um, so I mean, individual, yes and no. You know, because I try to make more a little bit more collective moments today, yeah. but I think what really like the exhibition is the ritual of our times like i said earlier like if you know they are at the center they are, they are the buildings with the most architectural effort also if you look at any society human society the most elaborate buildings will always be their temple so if you look at our cities in the west you will always find this kind of museum temple like you don't find like a great cinema by frank gehry You don't find a great theater by Jean Nouvel, maybe in France a few, there are a few, but you will find in every city like, you know, a museum by Rem Kolas now or by Zahadid or, you know, by these kind of very elaborate kind of church-like buildings. And this is a clear sign that this is a ritual where our society shows itself, you know. And so to go into, so that's what really exists in the art. Yeah, it's part of that ritual. It's an important part of that ritual, but the ritual is nonetheless the, how do you say, like, is on a, is on a higher level of importance. And so to, for me to work with, with, with this format, you could say also format if you're scared of the word ritual, mm -hmm. um, is, is, is a great privilege, yeah. Not completely scared of the whole ritual because the question number three was <laughs> ritual, non-ritual. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so I had something, I want to ask you something about that. Maybe we continue on that. And probably a bit more related to, to the architecture of the space, no? Hmm. I mean, it's interesting. For me, at the, at the beginning, it was interesting to think that you're working here in a, in a place which was devoted to, which was built during the first industrial revolution and was hmm. epitome of, of that kind of... Uh, Uh, work, or the kind of production, no? but a moment also where work was somehow uh, the new religion. And this is clear in, the, in some details of the architecture and in Binario Uno where the exhibition is. No? The end of it, it looks like a Roman church with this motif, no? with these windows. And, uh, and I was thinking that, that, uh, that there is a probably because of, of the physical character of this uh, space, uh, probably compared to other exhibitions, I mean, I haven't seen Palais de Tokyo, for example, there is a little bit more, um, I don't know if it's ritualistic, but there is a sense of time suspended sometimes, or beautifully suspended through chant especially, in the exhibition here. Um, you now when the two uh, girls Uh, come together singing or where there is this, this collective singing and there's a beautiful, which is not mystical, but I would say that compared to other exhibitions, probably you increase this, this character. So I was wondering, well, basically it's a continuation of, the, of, a, of a ritual or, <laughs> or how is ritualistic, because in many other cases, your work probably, especially at the beginning, at the, at the There's always a, a pinch of irony or a lot of irony and a lot of uh, creating also awareness of where you are and deconstructing the, the, the situation. 
and not really seducing. Mm. But of course here there are also moments of, let's say, beauty mm. created in a space where the acoustic is, we, 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 you, the first time you came you were no, uh, checking the sound with Cora and uh, so I'd like to maybe continue on this idea of a ritual in this situation and uh, on the seduction and yeah. I mean the definition of a ritual is like it's something where you go, you pass a threshold, I mean there's ritual studies now and what they say is like you pass a kind of threshold and you leave a certain kind of everyday reality and you come into another reality. So that's definitely true for museums. It's just a weird ritual because it, like I said earlier, trains you in taking a distance where most other rituals want to kind of involve you, you know, like very deeply into the belief of something. Well, whereas like, like secular rituals, like the museum want, want you to induce in the belief of not believing, which is the belief of history and rationality. So it's a complex thing which is happening because you're training to be a non-believer in a way, <laughs> you know? And um, <clears throat> so, and it's true what you say, I cannot really add so much to what you say. Like, at the beginning my work was more kind of showing this ritual, showing this format, like what kind of a space is it Why we don't look at humans, but we look at things. So I did this works with museum guards, maybe you saw at the Biennale di Venezia, like in 2003 or 2005, I showed these works where museum guards are dancing, museum guards are singing. So then you're like, oh, okay, wait a minute. Like, what is this kind of place where I look at things and I don't look at objects, I look at things and don't look at people? And like I thought, okay, I can put the work in. And now that I've established my work somehow, it's true that like I can create a little bit more my own codes. And it's true, it's become more, I would say it's become more, a bit more mystical. I mean, I would hope for it. I would hope for it, but I don't know if it works, you know? Like, this is for you to decide. But I'm not scared of these things. And um, I'm happy if, and I think singing, the reason why singing has become more important because that's also like if you think of the Catholic mass or any kind of ritual, the singing is always a way to bring you closer to God somehow, especially on, live singing, you know, like not to a microphone. On the other side, what I found, this is a kind of a footnote to it, but what I found always very uh, uh, refreshing from your work from the beginning was for me not really coming from neither uh, dance net loving so much traditional performance, in the 60s, 70s performance, that was very much of a ritual, no? Uh, like, and it related to, to religion, like think of the Viennese actionism, no? With a sort of bond with sacrifice or with Catholic, uh, and that was very, and very much inscribed on the body of the performer, which was most of the time the body of the artist himself. Now you, you, you don't work in this direction at all, this, as we said, always this sort of irony or detachment or always in and out. Um, so it's not really a question, but uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's to say that, um, yeah, you skip some of the, let's say, the, 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 tradi the, the traditional uh, uh, topos of, of uh, performance art in that sense. Even if there is confrontation here, you know, people really come and, uh, and, and on the other side, oh, that was probably the point in relation to ritual, Am I going too fast? Um, there is this ambiguity between, we talk at the beginning, and maybe this is the way to, to close it, uh, at least when we give to the, to the audience, uh, that yes, your work somehow is an antidote to deficit attention, or you uh, ask for a, 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 a lot of time. I mean, you were saying that basically the old choreography probably lasts more than two hours, but it's never the same, the blocks are we don't want to reveal so much of the structure, but anyway, it's, it's, it's very long, so you ask for it, but ne ne nevertheless, people can come in and out. It's, it's focused, but it's distracted uh, at the same time as uh, in the 18th century theater, no? where also people were looking at each other in the theater, there was this social seduction somehow that you were, or social confrontation you were uh, saying before. So, um, uh, yes, if there is a ritual, again, it's very democratic because there's no, no a procession to follow somehow, no? with Hermann Nietzsche, with, uh, with the bloody goat uh, <laughs> and everybody following or something like this. But it's a constant interaction, it's constant, uh, sometimes very gentle, sometimes uh, uh, more aggressive. And, um, maybe the last uh, 
silly question, as silly as the first one, <laughs> just to conclude, is how, after a few years of practice, and also your work is getting more and more popular, is, 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 in, uh, is displayed in big institutions, how do you, do you, let's say, try to work against the risk of becoming a style, or how do you know, or to, to try to work against the possibility of people, oh, Tino Segal again. It doesn't seem his work is, is the problem now, because a lot of people is coming in, but how do you, uh, that's a problem of every artist, somehow even working on a painting, but. I mean, one way I try to do is I don't believe like, that you could, like just because you're a successful artist that you're like a, a genius of creativity. I think like as you mature, and when I talk to younger artists, I try to tell them like don't, you know, don't force yourself to be creative. You know, you mature as a human being and then something else comes out, you know? Mm. And you have to wait sometimes. And, and also the field of contemporary art, you know, especially in Italy, but in many countries, is still a very small field, you know? Like one reason why you know, I mix new things, I have a few new things, and I have a lot of things that have been shown before here, but I don't know, like, there's maybe two, three people here in the audience, I would guess, who've seen stuff before. So for most people, it's anyway new, you know, because, so for me, it was like, okay, I try to show good things, and I don't think so much about, like, what I think is the best I can do, what I think is good, and I don't ask myself so much, like, is it now new or old or something, you know? Um, so, then if it becomes a style, I don't have a problem with that. You know? <laughs> yeah, but I think we should open it up yeah. to the audience. No, can we do that? The one who resisted. No, there's still. Yeah, we have half an hour. Like we have a mezz'ora. So, or anche meno. Ma se qualcuno vuole. Do you have a microphone? Il momento più imbarazzante. Tino parte domani, quindi è l'ultima possibile. <laughs> <laughs> Very early, no. <laughs> Hi. I have two questions, one for Tino and one for Luca. Um, for quoting again Boris Groys, in his uh, last book, In the Flow, Groys say that uh, every curatorial project is uh, a project by a dictator. Uh, so we read that uh, this exhibition uh, is uh, created, is created by. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask to Tino, which is your relation with the uh, curatorial and you could, you could, uh, with the curatorship in general, uh, to Luca, uh, is, is it possible to create Tino? I mean, maybe I can say one thing, you know, like also because people tend to think, like I was saying earlier, that these formats exist for so long time, but if you think, you know, like people like Duchamp or something, they did their first solo show when they were 60, you know, and now solo show is a format which exists, but this is a very new form phenomenon, and the, the solo show as a total work of art, kind of a one work of art, there's a few artists who are doing this, but they're doing it a lot, like I'm friends with Philippe Pareno, for example, and like we're going to the same places doing our kind of one after the other in different countries, this solo show as a, so it's a very new phenomenon, like, and I think in, in, in that the curator becomes more like what in theater they call a dramaturg, so somebody you kind of talk about, you know, because, because the work is the show. Mm -hmm. So it, the artist is taking some space of the curator because the curator is more somebody who assembles individual works. And I think some curators have focused, they invite artists to solo shows, then they go away and they do group shows, you know, because that's where they can really realize themselves. Or the art, or the curator becomes a more like an impresario or something. So it's like, I want you to do some dramaturg, impresario, mm, mm, mm. inviter. Rispondo in italiano, ce l'hai anzi in italiano? Ma è possibile? No, certo che è possibile, se no non saremmo qua. Diciamo che eh, è vero quello che ha detto Tino. Nella mia esperienza di questa mostra, mh, onestamente, eh, la, la, la curatela è molto, è molto poca, perché eh, sta, era, eh, la curatela è pensare che in quello spazio il suo lavoro potesse funzionare e, e invitarlo qua. Onestamente, ormai Tino ha una... Un, tanto un'esperienza, una capacità e anche una struttura di lavoro no? con una sua assistente e, e un sacco di persone che lavorano con lui 
e quindi il mio ruolo da questo punto di vista credo fosse eh, e sia stato minimo, cioè è una struttura che, che ha lavorato eh, su, diciamo sulla mostra. Forse l'unica cosa, ma non so se ti, mi ricordo di avergli detto nel primo incontro, ho detto ma sarebbe bellissimo vedere forse anche un solo corpo venire dalla fine dello spazio no? e vederlo. Eh, e mi, sono, mi è fatto piacere, eh, ora ho sorpreso di vedere questo nuovo opera delle due persone che si avvicinano e cantano nello spazio vuoto, anche e soprattutto nello spazio vuoto credo che sia molto forte. Eh, il lavoro mio qua è stato forse quello più del, eh, di lavorare su queste cose, di lavorare sul deserto di Domus, di lavorare insieme all'ufficio stampa sul, sulla ricezione del suo lavoro e sulla diffusione attraverso, attraverso la stampa. Questo sembra niente, ma è forse la cosa più ampia che è stata pubblicata, eh, pubblicata su, su Tino. Eh, Tornando a 17 anni fa, o 14 anni fa, eh, lì c'era stato molto più lavoro in qualche senso, perché era una mostra collettiva e il suo lavoro, anche se aveva una grande importanza, rientrava in questa... Eh, e lì, sì, lì in qualche modo avevo addirittura, forse mi ero preso un po' una posizione autoriale, perché questa visita guidata che io scrivevo eh, e che poi facevamo, io e gli assistenti, o Francesca Minini della Galleria, era in qualche modo uno spazio ulteriore dove il suo cor il corpo, diciamo, che, 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 era che, che giustific giustificava l'azione di, di Segal, del suo, del suo lavoro. Perché in quei, eh, quegli anni forse Tino era anche più rigido nel fatto che i corpi che dovevano occupare uno spazio erano in qualche modo giustificati. Quindi c'era la guardia nei primissimi lavori, c'era il gallerista, noi aprimo la mostra poco dopo la sua prima personale di Jan Mott, dove Jan Mott aveva eh, interpretato i lavori. E quindi quello era stato un lavoro, e così anche nella pubblicazione. Ma qua sono fin troppo bravi loro a, a, a gestire tutto questo spazio. E, anzi, devo dire che è bellissimo vedere lavorare eh, eh, lui insieme e, e ai, ai, ai ballerini, i ballerini tra di loro, che si aiutano, che discutono, che, 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 che pensano insieme eh, a un movimento, a una cosa da fare piuttosto che l'altra. Quindi no, il dittatore, no, non credo. in questo caso assolutamente no. No dictatorship, I guess. Well, I have a question for you. <laughs> like, um, because it's the first time that I see this kind of like outsourced translation Like for those of you who speak English and Italian, like was it precise or was it helpful or was it very wrong? Huh? Wrong, yeah. I don't think it can work, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, who thinks it was most <laughs> who who thinks it was mostly wrong? <laughs> who thinks it was mostly right? Yeah. Or oh, nobody. <laughs> Yeah, it's very complex to do in writing, I think. That's why I was curious at the beginning to, to watch it. Because I think that, like... It's quite beautiful, though. <laughs> to write something, what people are saying. I mean, already translating is so difficult, but then to even write is even more difficult, I think. Was it funny? I mean, was it the difference between what we said and, and what was written was funny? Because I saw one where I thought it was the opposite. It's like a Pierre Bismuth work or something. Huh? huh? Lost. Yeah. What, he needs a microphone. Sì, allora, volevo solo eh, dire che preferirei una, una traduzione più classica, eh, visto che il curatore sa benissimo l'inglese, perché questa traduzione la trovo un pochino, diciamo, troppo sintetica, forse sì. Un po' troppo... Eh... Ci preferivi che io facessi anche l'italiano? Ma io, poi io credo ah, no, che... No, ma nel tempo in cui c'è questo, questo momento in cui c'è la traduzione, anche credo l'autore possa eh, rilassarsi e pensare meglio a quello, che dire, a quello che si può dire dopo. Cioè, la traduzione classica io, io la preferisco, ecco. Poi non vorrei offendere <ride> Vabbè, nessuno se... Un test. se eh, volevo sa sapere se... Dietro questa traduzione c'è una persona oppure c'è un, un, 
c'è una persona in mezzo. Possiamo andare dietro lo schermo a vedere. No, ma è una curiosità. È come un artwork, they have to write it themselves. <laughs> Ci sono persone che traducono oppure è una curiosità mia? Eh? Non... Sai quando telefoni, eh, no, anzi ti telefono tipo la Vodafone, dico chiamiamo, da, chiamiamo dall'Italia. Invece, no. no, scherzo. Non è lo un so. Google traduttore o remote? Un... Remote. No. Remote. So. Remoto. Perché c'è un'altra domanda lì? Ma non sulla yeah. traduzione, però. Yeah. Volevo sapere se eh, lui si aspetta il pubblico, eh, un coinvolgimento del pubblico, nel senso che eh, gli interpreti eh, si avvicinano al pubblico, ma il pubblico non interagisce mai. Cioè si aspetta che in qualche momento, eh, prima o poi, il pubblico, che ne so, si metta a camminare con, eh, con gli attori, eh, oppure... È qualcosa così, non so, questa è la domanda. Cioè, si aspetta maggior coinvolgimento da parte di chi eh, assiste o il ruolo è soltanto passivo? Ecco. I have to translate, actually. No, he's asking if uh, you expect uh, how much of a participation and reaction you expect, because he noticed that there's not much participation and interaction in uh, so far? Well, I think that mm, I mean, again, like, you know, watching is a form, being there is a form of participation. You know, we're looking at a painting as a form of participation, I would say, you know. And um, so there's always participation in my definition. I'm personally not necessarily looking for people to kind of walk with us or start singing, but if it ha I am very much interested in what can you do in these kind of more choice-oriented or free or liberal spaces, you know? So I try to create a situation which is engaging, but where you still can, you don't have to engage in a literal sense, you know? I did works around like 10, 12 years ago, like this progress where if you didn't participate, the work didn't really exist. You know? Also this objective. Uh, yeah. I mean, that was more playful, but yeah, especially yeah. this progress, which is a known work of mine, one of the more known works, let's say, is where you, you, you meet a child, the child asks, what is progress? Then you uh, meet a teenager, the con conversation continues, and you meet an adult person, then you meet a senior person. You know, like, if you don't answer to the child and you leave, you don't really experience the work. So after that, I was interested that you can participate, but you don't have to, you know? And, but it's true that this work here is m less interaction based. I mean, there's the speaking with the visitors, you can speak back. I don't know if some of you were in the show, if you spoke with them, they tell you a story, you can also talk back at them. If they feel like staying, they can stay. But there's other works of mine, I mean, it's true that this is more theatrical. There's m many works of mine which are more interactional, let's say. Yeah, but maybe, Ms. My, uh, my question probably we didn't. I think it's very important and it's very interesting what you say also to to Aubrey about this algorithmic. No, this idea that your works is like an algorithm, algorithm. The idea that uh, yeah, it's not interaction, but there is also a, 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 a flexibility in relation to to the to the the answer of the of the audience. No, like ap happens again in in in, uh, in uh, on internet no? that you. You Google that song and then becomes something similar, no? It's like a desire. Um, so maybe you can say something about it because I think it's, again, coming back to the way your work is related to our, uh, you know, digital world. Yeah, if, if people would start participating in this explicit way very strongly, then we would react to that. We wouldn't... If, let's say, people start singing, maybe we would be silent if the singing is nice, you know? Or we would, you know, react in a different way. Or, s or if people start rolling around on the floor, then we... M I mean, we would think about what the answer is to that, you know? What is the answer which... Because when people are to participate in a more theatrical way, it's also always an issue because 
when other people come in, other visitors, they think, oh, this is the work, you know, but maybe what people are, the other visitors are proposing is not so um, in line with my work, let's say, you know. So there's also a question how to deal with that or something. But in general, I find that the, the Italians are quite open. Like when we come to them and speak, I feel that they are quite open to participate more than the French, for example. Uh, qual, guarda, c'è qualcuno in fondo, in fondo, in fondo. Ah, adesso si vede meglio. Last survivors. Mi chiedevo questo. Uh, avendo portato questa sorta di rottura nella uh, percezione, nella partecipazione al, all'arte museale con questo genere di performance, in un momento in cui in un altro campo artistico, quella del performance art, c'è una ricerca di un'analoga rottura, cioè di una contaminazione fra la perfor- l'arte percepita, l'arte performativa percepita e quella che coinvolga direttamente il pubblico, in qualche modo lo inglobi e lo, faccia, lo renda partecipe di una collettività che mescola l'individualità. Ti è mai capitato di uscire dal campo, diciamo, dell'arte, eh, dell'arte di questa arte e di sperimentare eh, nell'altro settore per vedere quale fosse l'effetto? O ti è venuta curiosità di farlo? Do you need me? Yeah, I think I understood. I mean, I would be curious who you're thinking of if you're thinking of this other, other field you know, which is not the visual art field, which engages the viewers, what are you thinking of? Like, which artists or which groups or...? Uh, I'm thinking about performance art, like festival in street art or site-specific uh, performance in the public space uh, or something uh, like this, theater or dance. And okay, okay, yeah. No, I've done a little bit like that, yeah. I mean, I did something on the Jama Efna, the main square of Marrakesh in Morocco, this kind of halka where you kind of we just dance and sing on the square and then there's like the 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 Zufi guitarists or the snake charmers um or I did something in the Paris Opera for the ballet of the Paris Opera or for also for a theater in Berlin now recently so I am interested but there's something you come into a different kind of agreement. You know, when you theater, it's again this agreement, you have to all be very collective, very rigid, you have to be there at 7.30, what I was talking about earlier, you have to sit there together. So the Paris Opera, I played with this and I made it more like an exhibition. At the end, we even went outside with the dancers. I really tried to use the whole building at the Paris Opera. But also something that people don't, in my opinion, don't like to think about so much is about quantity. You know, when people think about art, they don't want to think about quantity. But the fact is that many more people can go and see... I mean, the exhibition allows for many more people to pass through than a theater of the same scale, let's say, you know. And on the other hand, doing something in the street let's say like street theater, and sometimes I think my work, I have a lot of respect for street theater because in street theater you really have to garner the attention, you really have to create the attention. Well, like the, the, in the exhibition or also in theater, you already have, in mean, theater you really have the attention because you're forcing people to be attentive mm. by sitting down. But um, but in the, in the museum or exhibition space, people decide that they want to see something. While in the street they don't, Nessie want to see something, you have to seduce them even more to stay. We have to seduce them a little bit to stay a bit longer or, you know, make the case that this is worthwhile more than like the few seconds that one normally looks at a painting. So I, I am interested in doing something in the street, but also not so interested because I like this fact that people make the choice that they want to experience something now. You come on a Sunday afternoon, you want to experience something. I'm not trying to convince you that you, ha- you want to see something then I can decide what the something is inside places like this one. Thank you. I was just wondering how 
you shape your work depending on the space and the museum you work into or depending on the kind of thing you're interested in at the moment <laughs> or depending on the performers that you kind of work with? Yeah, I think it's it's also a question of ideology, let's say, you know, like to maybe give a bit bigger answer. It's like the ideology of the 20th century is a little bit like Henry Ford or something, you know, like, or objectivity, you know, like you do a thing and then it can function everywhere, you know? And I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, a friend of mine was saying yesterday how like the pasta tastes different in Italy, you know, because of the water, you know? Huh? It's not true, it's true. <laughs> Yeah, and so so I think the 21st century, like Luca was saying, we're coming back to also older knowledge, you know, like to do something which is specific to a place gives a higher quality, you know, and it's not this Henry Ford model of like conveyor belt, I put this, I put this, which is also a little bit the model of even Warhol, you know, like of modern yeah, art, sure. like do, do, and of, of, you know, like I produce a painting, I produce a painting, can be there, can be there, can be there, it's up to the curator where they place it. And I think nowadays artists, especially, I mean, the most extreme is Pierre Huyghe. I mean, I don't know if you know him, a French artist. You know, like everything has to be very connected with the environment, with the specificity of the situation, you know. And um, so for me, I really, I want to engage, I want to do the right thing for this place. You know, because I, my work doesn't exist in a vacuum and exists with like, here there's a few hundred people who come per day on the weekends. It's not a few thousand people like at the Tate, for example, or like the Tate's actually more, more than 10,000. And it's, it's a space which has a certain kind of quality and I want to do the right thing that works well in this space. You know, like if, and, you know, to say a stupid metaphor maybe, you know, I don't want to go to a sushi place in Torino, you know? Like in Torino, I go to Italian place because it's good here, you know? Like, I don't want to do something which, just because I want to do, I'm thinking about this, which doesn't work in this space. No, like I have to, or just because it's new, you know? Like I want to do the right thing for this space and connect with this space. And the, like Luca was saying, the space is more than just the architecture. It's like, for example, also if, if I, if you know, Nicola invites Luca and me or something, you know, in in two years and say, oh, you know, like I'm still thinking about your show, let's do it again, yeah. Then part of the context is that we already did this, you know. So all of this matters, you know. It's not only the architecture. Yeah. Um, it's also like, yeah, I well, know, like I did a show ten years ago in Villa Reale, Milano. Who saw that show? Probably almost nobody or two people. You know, who saw the show at Villa Reale? Yeah, you saw it? yeah, two people. Yeah. So. This is the context, I know that, you know, I'm thinking, okay, people don't necessarily know my work in Torino, so I can show, you know, like... It was extremely different context, so historically loaded, no? Yeah. So. Because you're a different person well, than Massimiano Gioni, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's no, the influence no, of the curator, yeah. No, 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 this, no, no the, 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 the context was extremely different. Not yeah, but, but Massimiano chose that context, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> But, um, no, in the sense your work really uh, comes uh, somehow in a long uh, tradition of questioning the context, no? From the middle of 60s, so you mentioned Buren before, but now with a degree of, of, let's say, sophistication of attention to the conditions that, and introducing this time thing, which, is, which was not something that was, well, maybe Robert Morris, I mean, but was happening so much in back in the days. Now it's really not at the end, but it's like the evolution of this long interrogation of a context and uh, and the listening to the to the situation, which is um, in your case is really strong. Was it? Yeah. Tutto bene? No. Agnolotti? No, in a sense, like uh, <laughs> no. There you go. I mean, when you are making some studies about your work, what do you think about provocation? Do we need to 
I mean, in this case, do you need to provocate the society or the visitors, or do you just don't think about it? Yeah, I don't think about it, but why do you have that question? Well, because in the performance art right now, many people just, um, many performance artists, uh, I think they want to provocate society to maybe to give some meaning to their works, but to, or to have a voice, but, um, well, just, just because. And do, you, do you think my work is provocative? No, I don't think. No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that the provocation is childish. It's 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 not mature because it relies on this idea that like you can be outside of our society and that you're somehow no better and that you're a better human being. No, like we're all part of the same society. I don't know anybody who really wants to be outside of the market. I mean, people talk about that, but. Everybody wants to do something specialized. I don't know people. And even if you want to go outside of the market, you first have to really go inside of the market to buy yourself a piece of land where you would farm yourself. You know. So I don't really know what it means. I mean, I studied Loftus Neo avant-garde, like the Situationists, and you know they're talking about like you know being outside of commodification. And then the reality is that you know their girlfriends are working as a translator, financing them to say we want to be outside of the market. It's like grow up, you know, get a life. And so, so this kind of attitude is, is for me totally uninteresting. So I'm very happy um, if you say it's not provocative. I want to interact with people. I want to, um, you know, put something into the space which is worth experiencing, which maybe kind of offers some kind of reflection to people. But I don't assume that like I am right and, and the visitors are all wrong. We're all in this kind of um, story together. What does it mean to be a society of eight billion people on a planet, you know? And how can we be so individualized and at the same time be so many? And how can that all work? This is a big experiment, you know? People tend to forget that in my opinion. And how can we reflect upon that? And if I can contribute a little bit to something that's great, but I'm not going to go and say, like, you know, it's cheesy also, yeah. Pasta così, no. <laughs> but now it's still not under two hours, no? No, no, siamo velocissimi. Volevo solo chiedere che ruolo, quanta libertà hanno avuto i ballerini e le persone che partecipano alla... Eh, insomma alla situazione nel, nell'elaborarla cioè quanto conta l'idea primaria dell'artista e quanto si modifica nell'interazione con chi poi la deve fare materialmente how much freedom the dancers had uh, from your idea or how much they improvised very different. I mean, some things are very improvised, some things are game structured, some things are um, like game structured, I mean, like there are rules of the game, like in football, but then how you play football, I mean, uh, Totti is different than Baggio, you know, like how they play, you know, and so, but it's the same game, you know, and but very different personalities, and... Um, You know these people for a long time, no? Some of them. Yeah, and then, then there's other, but there's, but it depends on the work, you know, like for example, sometimes we do a kiss here, this duet is 100% choreographed, there's nothing improvised, you know? And other moments are game structured, like I said, other moments are more, like the singing when the two work to each other, like the beginning is improvised with some rules, and then when they meet, it's, it's a song, it's like, it's totally written. So I mix a lot between these different modalities. I think we're done, no? Yeah. I can get off this stage. I really don't like stages, so I can really... <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've been on a stage in a long time. Grazie, <laughs> grazie. Ci scusiamo per la traduzione. Nel tentativo di voler essere innovativi ci siamo resi conto che non ha funzionato. Faremo so meglio per il futuro. Grazie per la pazienza.